first attraction of Montino was done uh, by means of the so-called Reins Howard technique, which is still uh, very valid, which is based on the so-called inverse beta decay of proton. Why inverse beta decay? Because it's the absorption of an anti neutrino onto a proton with the production of a neutron and a positron. So it is of course, the same diagram that controls uh, free neutron beta decay, uh, brackets of the name of inverse beta decay. Uh, this is good. It's a nice process because it has uh, two interesting features uh, that can be exploited particularly in liquid or solid scintillators, but liquid scintillators are the best. Why this? Because you have two events. The first, which happens very quickly, is the emission of the positron. Very quickly means, of course, the emission of the positron is at essentially instantaneous in any scale. But even the stop and the absorption of the positron with the emission of two gas is relatively quick, a few nanoseconds. Okay? Uh, actually, it can be faster than that uh, unless there is a positronium formation, which happens typically 50% of the time. So if uh, positronium forms, particularly orthopositronium with the, the spins that are in a triplet state, uh, then uh, it takes a few nanoseconds for the positronium to decay. But this is, we call it a prompt event, fast, okay, nanosecond scale. Then, the average is one or two nanoseconds, it can be three, four, five if you have positronium, or less than one. If you don't have positronium, the average is typically one or two. The second event is due to the fact that the neutron will start moving. The neutron is relatively fast, not, not very fast, but somewhat fast. It's not a thermal neutron. I hope you understand the difference between a thermal neutron and a fast neutron. So this is going to be a fast neutron that will thermalize relatively quickly. Let's say 10 nanoseconds to thermalize. But then, due to the relatively small capture cross section on proton, in an inorganic liquid scintillator in which you essentially the capture of proton or on carbon, but on, on carbon it's even longer. Uh, it takes typically a few hundred microseconds to be captured. The 250 is a typical number for, for pseudocumene or other organic liquid scintillators. Can be much faster if you add a material that is very efficient in capturing neutron, for example, gadolinium or boron. Gadolinium is the typical one. The cross-section for neutron capture in gadolinium is a factor of 100 higher than typical nuclei. So that number from 250 microseconds become a few microseconds. But this is nice because you have a prompt event, which is a 1 MeV event, a 1, 1, 22 event, made by the two gammas of the positron annihilation, plus the one gamma line, 2.26 MeV, coming from the deuteral formation of the neutron. This allows to tag the neutrino very efficiently because this uh, pam pam coincidence event is very neat to find. You have two radioactivity events in the liquid scintillator. Uh, that can be quite easily identified. Um, this technique was invented by Reins and Cowan in the 50s and was used to discover the neutrino on June 56. I 
I'd like to stress that there is a nice story. Look at the, at the date. It's June 1456. So the, the credit of the discovery uh, is correctly given to Isaac. But at the very same time, on the other side of the Iron Curtain, uh, in Debrecen, Hungary, this picture was taken. This is uh, the decay of lithium-6 in uh, electron, and it's a beta decay of lithium-6 in a cloud chamber. This picture is the first picture um, that neatly show that the beta decay is a three-body decay, because you have the track of the nucleon and the track of the electron that clearly do not match. So, this is, you can claim this is also a discovery of the neutrino. And uh, the reason why I like to stress it is because there is a piece of history in Europe that was also recognized by European Physical Society, because this group, uh, a few days after this discovery, which happened uh, a few weeks before the discovery of Reinsen, was destroyed by the invasion of Soviet Union of Hungary in 56. So uh, this group never published this result because of those events. And then the group disappeared. So uh, it's, it's a very a posteriori recognition of this, uh, but it's not incorrect that uh, the original was first discovered in Hungary. So, uh, another feature of neutrinos, which is also the last historical slide, and then I go to, to physics. Uh, um, you know that, of course, there are three neutrinos. The fact that we know there are three comes uh, from the direct detection of the three types, because we know that they have separate interactions. And of course, we have an either indirect, but very clear, result from the left, starting the line shape of the Z, clearly the cross-section, the B plus minus cross-section of the Z peak is very well consistent with the three neutrinos and not four and not two. So uh, it's absolutely uh, evident there are three neutrino types coupled to the Z. If there are more than three neutrinos, this plot shows that they are not coupled to the Z or they are very heavy, but if they are very, very heavy, I'm not sure that even the word neutrino is appropriate. Uh, the additional neutrinos, if they do exist, they are not coupled to the Z and so they are called sterile. The reason why we occasionally speak of sterile neutrinos is because if additional neutrino components exist, they are definitely not coupled to the standard model in the way other neutrinos are. It's relatively important to reco recall, I'm sure you know, but the way uh, Lederman, Schwarz, and Steinberger proved that the muon neutrino is not the electron neutrino, it's a different particle, is because they proved by making the first muon neutrino beam using the very same technique we use now, which is uh, to produce uh, mm -hmm. ion beam from proton interaction on the target, collect the pion, let the pion decay, and then collect the muon neutrinos produced this way. Steinberger, Schwarz, and Lederman made the effort to build a detector in which muon neutrinos interact. And they proved that muon neutrinos produce muons but not electrons, while electron neutrinos produce, produce electrons and not muons. So they definitely proved what we know now very well that uh, muons and Electrons are leptons coupled to the W. They are both coupled the same way with the so-called lepton universality, but they are 
neutrino that couples to the new one and the W is one particle, and the neutrino that couples to the electron and the W is another. Third, the same story was done much more recently with the tau neutrino in 95 by the Dunlop experiment, which made the first direct detection of tau neutrinos by using the very same technique. And even more recently, the Opel experiment in Grassas has detected tau neutrinos from the neutrino oscillation. But this is a different story. But the tau neutrinos from the direct detection, the same experiment with tau neutrinos was done in Fermilab in 95, 96. So, uh, summary of uh, Neutrino interaction in the standard model. Uh, as far as the low energy interaction are concerned, you can use the low energy approximation of the standard model, which is essentially the Fermi theory with some change. Some change because, of course, the Fermi theory was a charged interaction theory. Only the first term with the charged currents was included. Actually, of course. I make it short on the history, but clearly Fermi did not know anything about particle violation, so the original Fermi theory was the current for the interaction with vector structure and particle was conserved. It took almost 15 years, 20 years to solve the mess generated by a few wrong measurements plus a few wrong theories. And uh, understand the vector minus axial structure of the current. I go quickly because I assume you know. If you don't, you should uh, learn. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you, do you know, Laura? Yes. Do you know? You, you, <laughs> you don't. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so, vector uh, V minus A, and this is the first term, okay? J mu, J mu is, uh, is the curve. Then you have uh, the, the neutral current interaction. Neutral current interaction is uh, the second term, which was not present in Fermi theory and was not present in the correction of the Fermi theory, it's a genuine uh, improvement in the standard model. That form is uh, the low energy effective theory. So the W is integrated out, we don't see the W, it's the current current structure with the neutral current term. The rho parameter is the, essentially the ratio between the W and the C mass and the binary angle. And G Fermi is the standard coupling constant. So, uh, Rho has a very well defined prediction in the standard model. It's not a big parameter, it's uh, something that is predicted to be there. The observation of the neutral current interaction, which is the second diagram, is the first crucial historical confirmation of the standard. I'm not an historian, but as far as I understand, the, 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 the level of faith into the standard model had a phase transition after the discovery of neutral currents by the, made by the Gargamel experiment, and very soon, the, one year after, confirmed by the discovery of the charmed core that, as you know, was an essential ingredient of the standard model because you cannot consistently make the standard model without uh, families with an even number of particles. You cannot have three quarters or five quarters. There must be structured families if you want to be consistent. So you have two interactions. One transforms a neutron a neutrino in and the other one produce an elastic scattering term. It's useful to see these diagrams 
from the point of view of the experimentalist, uh, which makes the story a little different, in the sense that when you focus not really to the diagrams but to the physical process, you see that there are important differences related to the physics. So you can detect neutrinos by hitting neutrinos with what? Well, you can scatter on a nucleus, making a charge current interaction. This is uh, in principle available for all neutrino types, but in practice there are substantial differences. That are due to the very different mass of the electron, the new one, and the tau. So it is true, of course, that lepton universality holds, but lepton universality is a property of the matrix elements, not of the cross sections. Because the cross section depends also on the free space, on the kinematics, on the energy. This uh, is often forgotten by high energy physicists because they live in a world where all the leptons are light. Hmm? Especially the electron and the muon. You never, you, you don't see a world in which uh, the muon mass is large compared to your energy. But this is not the case in underground physics and in particular in neutrino physics. So if the neutrino energy is well is below the muon mass, the first process is possible only for electron neutrinos. This is an important feature because it's one way to, in which you can use to distinguish between the neutrino types. If you are at low energy and you see an electron neutrino, an electron or a positron, you are sure that the interaction was due to an electron neutrino. The elastic scattering is again possible in principle for all neutrinos, but the cross section is different. This is diagrammatic thing, because of course when you are scattering with an electron, the, the electron neutrino has an additional diagram. This is not, of course, in, the, in this case you don't expect any universality because your target is an electron. The model says that the cross section between a neutrino and an electron is not the same if the neutrino is an electron type or another type. So you can detect all neutrino types scattering of electrons, but the cross section is different. Then you can do elastic scattering. Elastic scattering is absolutely blind, flavor blind. The cross section is absolutely the same for all neutrino types. You can have, uh, and uh, the difference might come from the status, the state of the nucleus. You can break the nucleus, for example, a deuteron. And in this case, you have a neutron and a proton in the final state if you are at low energy. If you are at very high energy, you break the nucleus completely and you do deep inelastic, but we'll discuss this in a moment. Another process that was never observed, but it would be very interesting to observe, is the theoretically predicted coherent scattering, in which you make elastic scattering of a neutrino with a nucleus. But this has never been observed, it's very difficult to observe because, of course, neutrinos are very light. And a few MEV neutrino, of course, will transfer to a very nucleus. A, new, a very tiny amount of energy, and so there is a fundamental difficulty to design a detector that is massive enough to detect an event because the cross section is very small, but at the same time is sensitive to energy release of a few hundred electron volts because this is what you expect. This has never been done so far, there are attempts design a detectors of this kind because it would be very interesting to study the coherent scattering of neutrinos on nuclear, but the problem is not to solve yet. So this is uh, the status. 
of the physics program at very low energy. The diagrams, these diagrams are good for any energy, but of course, when you increase the energy, you start seeing the quarks, seeing the structure of the atoms, which means that you change from the transition in which you do a effective current interaction, so you essentially use this Lagrangian uh, putting the G parameters, not those of uh, the new one, but those the effective parameters of the nucleus, but you still use that Lagrangian at very low energy. At high energy, you must use the techniques that are the one suggested by the Parton model. So you have to study the interaction of the neutrino with the quarks and to the, use the machinery of the looping in the and of, of course QCD to compute the cross section. We don't care about the cross section, so I'm not covering at all. But I discuss a few phenomenological things that are relevant for the design of detectors. As I told you, the diagram is lepton universal, but the cross section is not. It's not very dramatic level. And even less is a universal the interaction of the lepton with your detector. So the signal you have in a detector is very different between the three and three. Okay? Don't, don't be fooled by, by the fact that the diagram is the same. It doesn't matter if the diagram is the same. You can see this. The difference is uh, related to here and to here. If you have a charge interaction, you have an electron. The electron can be an electron. The electron will always, at high energy, do an electromagnetic shower. So you start the Bramstrahl of photons, so the photons convert to pairs, and you have this electromagnetic shower that continues until, of course, the energy of the photons insufficient to make additional pairs. I assume you know what is an electromagnetic shower, but it's a very well-defined signature. The typical electromagnetic shower in a material as dense as water, which we take as an example, will be half a meter or something like that. One meter, two meters, depending on the energy, but it's relatively small. It's contained. It's all within some limited amount of volume. If you make a new one, from a new one neutrino, the new one is heavy, has a probability to make a very strong much smaller, and so it is a very penetrating particle. The new one goes a long way through a material. It's the most penetrating charged particle we know, because it's, it's heavy, it's but it's electron, so no strong interaction. So the typical behavior of a new one is to make a long trunk. Of course, it, it is possible that the new one interact with the nucleus and make secondary particles, but this is a relatively rare event. Typically, the new one will just go through for a long way. So long way that the new one can make kilometers in rock and reach Gansasola. So you still have a new one flux underground in the Ansalso, for example, or you have muon flux 3,000 meters underwater uh, from the atmospheric muons. So the penetration power of a 1 TV muon can be kilometers of rock. The tau is even, it's even different, because the tau is much heavier lepton, but being very heavy, is the past, 10 to the minus 12 seconds or something like that, which means that the tau will decay in a range of uh, 100 microns, a few millimeters, depending on the boost, depending on the energy, but it will decay. And the decay of the tau can be hadronic, which will make the detection super difficult because it will be very difficult to, dis to distinguish 
the atoms from the tau from the ions of the primary. Not impossible. You will see something about the other experiment that did the job, but requires a very clever and very specific technique. It's very difficult. You can have semi-electronic decay of tau, electronic decay of tau, sorry, leptonic decay of tau, not semi-electronic. And in this case, uh, uh, you have another lepton, an electron for a new one. In this case, it's, it's interesting to note, the tau neutrinos could be in principle a background to the other one. But this is uh, for the tau are usually much less, so it's the other way around. The muon interaction are a background to tau neutrinos with the tau with muon decay. Okay? It is also interesting to discuss about the other part, because uh, for what I will say later, uh, the other part is interesting because it is relevant for what I will have to say later. Uh, the hadrons means essentially ions. Of course, you make other ions, but uh, numerically, the typical hadrons coming out from this kind of collision are pions and chaos. Pions uh, are relevant because the neutron one is by zero. It goes to gamma gamma most of the time. And the gammas, of course, will do an electromagnetic shower. So the pi zero will mimic very well, unless you have a very good detector. There is always, all, essentially, you need a fine grade, very uh, high resolution power detector. Like, for example, the one you can obtain with the UV dark, but not many more. Because with a typical, uh, purely uh, scintillation or Cherenkov detector, you will not distinguish the shower produced by a pion, neutral pion, from the shower produced by the electron. <coughs> and this is relevant because if you have a muon neutrino that makes a new one, but then a pion in the outer part makes the electromagnetic shower, if for some reason you miss the muon, you call a muon neutrino what is it, or you call electron neutrino what is actually a muon neutrino. So it's a source of background and in general of mixing of the two components in your data set. You have, if you want to identify electron neutrinos, you have to be careful not to be failed by the background introduced by the electromagnetic shower produced by the pi zero. The only way around, exactly the opposite, is the charge pion, because occasionally the charge pion could make a lot of drag. This is less, this is more rare because the cross section of the pion with matter is larger and the range of a pion in matter is much shorter than that of a new one. But if you have a poorly designed detector, you could have a pion mimic a new one. So, the other way around. You could have a charged pion that makes a crack that you might be tempted to call new one and identify the neutrino as a new event. Last but not least, neutral atoms are another potential problem because a neutral atom can go, can go a long way because they are neutral, so they can range in matter that can be relatively large, and, but then they interact. So they could give you tracks that are very long way, and also that could potentially be background 